Welcome to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry, a clinician's guide to the latest psychiatric research. I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. Each episode, I interview a leading psychiatric researcher about how their work is shaping clinical practice. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Charles Nemeroff, Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UT Austin's Dell Medical School. Dr. Nemeroff is also Director of the Institute for Early Life Adversity Research and Co-Director of the Center for Psychedelic Research and Therapy. In our conversation, Dr. Nemiroff delves into the complexities of mood disorders, emphasizing the need for precision treatment and early intervention. He also explores psychedelic medicine, genetically tailored treatments, and the lasting impact of childhood trauma. Dr. Nemiroff, thank you so much for being with us today on the podcast. It's my absolute pleasure. Wonderful. Well, we're going to just jump right in. And can you give us an overview of your research journey and what drew you to focus on the neurobiology of mood disorders? So I started my career uh, in basic neuroscience and was interested in very basic brain mechanisms related to stress. And following my PhD degree uh, in neurobiology, I enrolled in medical school after a postdoctoral fellowship in research. So I wanted to blend my uh, strengths in neuroscience with my uh, budding strengths in psychiatry. And as I went through residency training in psychiatry, I focused largely on patients with mood and anxiety disorders, and then focused even more specifically on a group of patients that were relatively resistant to treatment. And it turned out that many of those had a history of childhood maltreatment. Very interesting. And from that kind of insight, what findings came out of that? So after 25 years of doing this research, It's been quite a sojourn. And so in the beginning, um, I did laboratory work that suggested that early life stress in the form of, in in laboratory animals, either uh, maternal uh, separation uh, as a model of, of early life stress resulted in changes in the brain and in the body that persisted for the lifetime of the adult. And then we moved those preclinical studies to clinical studies and started studying patients with depression or PTSD with or without uh, early life trauma experience. And we're able to determine a number of factors that conspired to increase vulnerability to depression, bipolar disorder, and PTSD. And one of the biggest factors turned out to be uh, child abuse and neglect. So In the course of doing these studies, uh, we realized that this was the ultimate gene-by-environment interaction model. You know, there are lots and lots of data in all all kinds of uh, medical subspecialties that would suggest that if you're genetically vulnerable for something, and then you have an environmental perturbation uh, that that promotes that, that disease vulnerability, you're more likely to get the disease. The the prototype uh, would be lung cancer. You may have a propensity for lung cancer, but if you never smoke, you might never get it. But if you have genetic vulnerability and smoke four packs a day, then it's pretty likely that you'll end up getting lung cancer. Well, we discovered that for folks that were genetically vulnerable to depression or PTSD, by virtue of changes in their genome, just mutations that spontaneously occur, those people who experience early life trauma, and remember that the brain, uh, the human brain doesn't develop until age 24 fully, so that the developing brain is very vulnerable to insult. So if you have genetic vulnerability for a major psychiatric disorder, and then on top of that, you're exposed to untoward early life events, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, or neglect, that markedly increases your risk to develop these disorders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a a lot of the episodes of this podcast have focused on precision medicine and understanding why certain individuals are more treatment refractory or why even they might have more risk factors to developing um, certain types of mental illness. And it sounds like that's what this work has done. And, and are these things that you hope in practice um, 
you know, more psychiatrists and medical professionals will be able to look for, measure, um, and make clinical assessment and judgments as a as a result? So the good, there's good news and bad news. So <laughs> let me start with the bad news. We just finished a very comprehensive review of the entire pharmacogenomics um, uh, platforms that are available to clinicians that claim to predict um, which medications a particular patient will respond to as regards an antidepressant in patients with major depression. And this this summary is in press in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And our conclusion, unfortunately, is that none of the currently commercially available um, uh, laboratory tests that claim they can predict uh, antidepressant response to one or another antidepressant has any validity at all. So it's wasting patients' time and money um, uh, as well as third-party payers. Having said that, I think the future of personalized medicine and psychiatry is really bright. And I think that we're getting better and better um, at what's known as polygenic risk scores so that we can identify patients who are at very high risk for schizophrenia, for PTSD, for major depression. I think that will become clinically useful. But in terms of predicting treatment response, um, I think it is the future, but it's, it's not ready now. Okay. But better, it sounds like better findings that are going to lead toward um, maybe, you know, diagnostic criteria for severe and persistent mental illness, but not necessarily for the treatment portion. That's where the research needs to continue to grow. Yeah, I, I think, you know, all of us would agree that Western medicine in general and psychiatry in particular currently by and large treats people when they um, are symptomatic. And what we'd like to do, partly because we have workforce shortages, is we'd like to identify an at-risk population and perhaps intercede early before they have that first manic episode, psychotic episode, or depressive episode. And I think we are moving uh, in that direction. Yeah, well, that that is promising and exciting to see that this hopefully can ultimately translate to the appropriate and the most effective treatments for patients as well. And speaking of novel treatments, you're one of the growing number of researchers who are studying psychedelic medicine right now. Which piece of the puzzle are you currently working on and why are you focusing your efforts there? In terms of my own research in our department here um, at Dell Medical School, um, we want to apply scientific rigor to a field that is, is just rapidly escalating. You know that you can't look at any social media site or any lay public scientific journal without hearing about psychedelics. And this is a huge topic in America today. And fundamentally, people view psychedelics as a panacea uh, and others uh, view it as a peril. And we would like to focus on what's the data, right? Like, Who are they good for? Who are they not good for? And I would limit my comments to to the use of these substances to treat psychiatric illness. A whole separate subject is whether people without a psychiatric illness could benefit in some kind of spiritual way from the use of psychedelics. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about is there a role for psychedelics in the treatment of refractory depression, refractory PTSD, refractory alcohol use disorder, um, uh, nicotine dependence, perhaps um, opiate dependence, anorexia, those kinds of disorders. And so if you look at the current data, I would start off and say that the MDMA uh, clinical trials for the treatment of PTSD shows the most robust clinical advantage of of that agent compared to placebo. So these are largely uh, patients with severe PTSD that have failed FDA-approved treatments. And um, the company that sponsors uh, MAP, uh, which is called MAPS, they just changed their name. I have no idea what the new name is, uh, has three, three fundamental randomized controlled trials that show a real effect of MDMA in these patients really suffering with PTSD. But remember that 
like all of the um, psychedelic trials, and unlike any other trial in medicine, um, they're not blinded, right? Because the patients know when they take a psychedelic and, and the observers rating them could tell they've taken a psychedelic. So they're not really, they're randomized, controlled, but not really double-blinded studies. And that's a confound uh, in these studies. But, you know, in spite of that, uh, the MDM, uh, MDMA data for PTSD is, is inordinately positive. It's a big clinical effect. Now, how that's going to roll out uh, as a commercial product is something we could talk about later. But from a scientific point of view, it's interesting. There's a recent study in Nature Medicine by Nolan Williams at Stanford who took the psychedelic Ibogaine and treated patients in an open study uh, with uh, traumatic brain injury and PTSD and, and obtained phenomenal results. You know, it was an open study, but nevertheless, uh, the uh, magnitude of the effect was remarkable. And then there are the psilocybin studies. So there have been multiple psilocybin studies with usually either one, two, or three uh, dosings um, separated by a certain period. And there's very clear uh, clinically and statistically significant effects um, in ameliorating depression, largely in a treatment-resistant population. The magnitude of the effect is clear, but not as great as was seen in the MDMA uh, PTSD studies. And again, there is the issue of blinding. Uh, and in both the MDMA and the psilocybin studies, it's coupled with a form of psychotherapy. So it's generally viewed as a combination of psychedelics uh, and some form of psychotherapy. The, the, there are some outstanding questions here. The first is, do you have to have a psychedelic experience in order to have a benefit? To put it another way, can you take a low dose known as a microdose of psilocybin every day and can you end up with a therapeutic benefit? If that's the case, that would be a game changer because currently when you administer a psychedelic, you know, the patient's going to be with you for six to eight hours while they have this very intense experience. They have to be driven home by a family member. Then they come back uh, for so-called integration sessions. So no one knows whether microdosing is going to work. If you go on the internet, there are a ton of uh, anecdotal reports from various people saying, I've been microdosing with psilocybin or LSD for, you know, a month, two months, three months, and it's, it's dramatically changed my life. Uh, Michael Pollan wrote a book about how LSD microdosing changed his life, became a bestseller. But we don't have any really good control data uh, in this regard. And is the hope, if we do have the data, that people would be able to microdose on their own without the six to eight hour experience and the subsequent integration session so that it might have a greater accessibility? Well, all of, all of what you just asked is completely unknown. So first, we have to know whether microdosing is going to be effective. Secondly, the issue of, of widespread exposure of these drugs is a naughty problem. So as you, I'm sure, know that in the 1970s, the Nixon administration uh, fundamentally outlawed all psychedelic research. And the field was completely nascent uh, for many years until um, a, a group in the United Kingdom started doing psilocybin studies looking at patients with depression. And that turned out to be a game changer because there was clear evidence of efficacy uh, in patients that had previously failed all other treatments. So there's now a resurgence. There are a number of startup companies uh, that have uh, psychedelic products, and they're in one or another stage of clinical trials. There are a couple of other forces that are going on in, that are good, and then there's some that are concerning. So what's good is that the National Institutes of Health have now agreed to begin to support psychedelic research, and so that will um, will absolutely 
result in a number of well-designed studies, peer-reviewed studies, um, with, which will help us answer a lot of questions. On the other hand, as you, I'm sure, know, uh, that certain states have legalized uh, psilocybin and other psychedelics, Oregon being the first state. And this has been done in a demedicalized model so that fundamentally in Oregon, you can uh, go to the mushroom store where the mushroom dispenser will recommend that you take a dose of three grams of mushrooms. The problem with that is mushrooms vary in their concentration of psychedelics. So three grams of one mushroom might be uh, giving you more or less of a psychedelic psilocybin than three grams of another mushroom. Uh, you then take the mushrooms that you've purchased to a practitioner who has been trained uh, via the internet for a certain number of hours, uh, but there will be no medical screening uh, of you, and there will be no medical guidance uh, or monitoring during the course of your psychedelic experience. Now, we know that psychedelics increase blood pressure. We know that, that patients with cardiac disease could be at risk for having a more serious adverse event from a psychedelic. Uh, and I published a report uh, in the last year, last December's American Journal of Psychiatry of a patient of mine who had a terrible psychotic episode after taking um, mushrooms on two consecutive days. Um, and, and that patient did not recover for about nine months and required inpatient hospitalization, uh, followed by a very severe depression. Uh, thankfully, she's doing well now. So if you step back for a minute and think about it, a, a couple of really important questions arise. One is, if you have a family history of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or severe depression, um, is it a good idea for you to take psychedelics? Uh, because will it flip you into a psychotic episode or a manic episode? And there are case reports that that's happened. And none of the uh, procedures, at least in Oregon, are going to screen for um, any uh, family history of psychiatric disorder. So that's one concern. The second is who is going to provide oversight to the widespread availability of psychedelics, right? Is it going to be, it's obviously not going to be the state medical board. So who is going to determine the medical oversight of delivering these very powerful medications? And my concern is that in the spirit of trying to understand who are psychedelics good for, who are they not good for? We have to do this research, and I don't want there to be a series of adverse events that throws us back into the Nixonian era. These are really powerful medications. Yeah, and it sounds like this is where your scientific rigor comes into play. And the other psilocybin researchers we were talking to also kind of emphasize understanding, yeah, is it, you know, understanding the dosage, understanding the environment, understanding how much, um, you know, integration or supervision of the process is needed. Um, and speaking of like the scientific rigor, this issue of the blinding, um, is that just an unavoidable problem because psilocybin is essentially like a PRN kind of uh, <laughs> medication, if you will? It's a real conundrum, the blinding. And we, we've, we've talked about this for hours uh, among our research group to try to come up with an idea. So one idea is that you would administer what 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 the 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 current tact has been to use low doses of psilocybin um, as the control. So in the compass studies, they used one milligram, ten milligrams, and twenty five milligrams. And the idea was that one milligram was fundamentally placebo. Ten milligrams might tickle you a little bit, but it's not terribly active. And twenty five milligrams is is the full dose. And that is an interesting approach, but it still doesn't help with the blinding. So the, the second approach, which no one's ever done before, is to use virtual reality to create a kind of psychedelic experience that would not be drug-related, right? So I could slap a virtual reality headset on you, and I could 
play, uh, you know, Yellow Submarine and have all sorts of cool animation and maybe have the walls breathe um, in what w would be likened to be a psychedelic experience. That's a possibility as a control. Another idea would be to use uh, psychoactive substances that are not psychedelic, like an amphetamine analog. So, you know, amphetamine is, you know, has uh, definite effects, right? But it's not a psychedelic, but it definitely does change the way you're thinking and feeling at the time. And no one has, uh, we're, we're, we're proposing to do that in a study uh, to compare uh, MDMA with, with D-amphetamine um, as, as an appropriate control. But I think that's, that's, I don't know of any other way to get around this problem. Yeah, very interesting um, challenge that it sounds like you're putting a lot of uh, effort and thought into seeing if there's a workaround or a work through. And, and given, some, given some of the promising results of psychedelics in treating treatment-resistant depression or alcohol use disorder, are there certain conditions that you feel more hopeful about with psilocybin in the future? I know you said also maybe watching out if you have a history of psychotic disorders in your family, maybe that's, you know, kind of a warning sign. But are there are there conditions that you feel more hopeful with and, and are excited to see where the research goes? Yeah. I, so the way I look at this is I think what psychedelics do is they disrupt um, what I call the circle of hell that patients go through. So treatment-resistant, uh, depressed patients fundamentally sitting around and they have this redundant tape that goes through their mind that fundamentally says, I'm a bad person, I'm a burden on my family, I'm a failure, I've made a huge amount of mistakes in the past, you know, life isn't worth living, I can't enjoy anything, uh, I'd, I'd be better off uh, not being here. And this is a tape that plays over and over. For patients with anorexia nervosa, they spend 80% of their time talking and thinking about food, right? They're thinking about how every molecule of food is going to add body weight to me, and they're thinking about how am I going to get through today where I'm supposed to eat with my mom, and she's going to be watching me, and I'm going to move my food around on the plate, and as soon as I eat, I'm going to go to the um, restroom and, and, and purge. Um, again, it's a tape that runs through their mind. In, in, with addiction, it's pretty clear, um, and, and I'm sure you're aware of it and the listeners are, that with addiction, you know, your whole life revolves around whatever you're addicted to. And, you know, when am I going to get the next dose? Um, how am I going to keep it from everybody? Then after using it, I feel guilty about it over and over and over. And I think, and then OCD, similarly, is obviously a disorder of, of intrusive thoughts that won't go away that make people miserable. PTSD, those recurring nightmares, the hypervigilance, the avoidance, they, all of these diseases have one thing in common, which is the default network, where your mind goes when you're not engaged in another activity, is this tape that constantly runs through your mind that's self-deprecating and miserable. And I think what psychedelics do is they blow that up and they, they allow you to be able to get out of that rut. One of the best examples is the studies that have been done in patients with metastatic cancer. Like if you have metastatic cancer, it is very hard not to think about end of life issues because they're real and they're miserable and they're anxiety provoking and they're frightening. And yet, uh, the psychedelic studies that have been done have shown that, that after a dose of psilocybin, these patients actually have less depression, less anxiety, less concerns about end of life. And I, I, so that's why I believe that whatever the neurobiological mechanism is, I think what they do is allow you to get out of that circle of hell. It's interesting, this theme that you're tying between all of these conditions, even one that we might say is more of a physical condition, um, is this feedback loop in the brain. And, and that's kind of shifting, breaking up the loop 
shifting perspective um, seems to be some of what you're seeing um, with the psilocybin intervention. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, uh, you know the problem with, the, you know, the plural of anecdote is not data, but you do need to listen to your patients. And I've had a lot of patients say to me, you know, I was in Afghanistan. I, I saw horrible things. I came home. I drank too much. I, I wasn't kind to my spouse. I wasn't as good as father as I should have been. Uh, and I, I was treated with SSRIs and therapy, and they helped a little bit. And then I went to Costa Rica, and I was administered a psychedelic, and I lost my desire to drink. And I sort of looked myself in the mirror and realized, you know, I'm just not being the kind of person I want to be. When you hear that five times, 10 times, 20 times, you need to listen to your patients. And so I, I really believe that there is, um, for some patients, this will be a boom, an absolute boom. I'm concerned. On the one hand, I'm concerned about widespread availability through non-medical uh, distribution uh, uh, routes. On the other hand, I'm worried about if, if these substances are approved by the FDA, um, are they going to be widely available because of the cost? As in, like, they're very expensive? Well, you know, pharmaceutical companies are there to make money. And, um, you know, if you look at the pricing of some of the recent medications uh, that are, are being, coming to the market, they're expensive. And society seems to be able to accept um, a $30,000 cost for chemotherapy for forms of cancer, and that's paid for by third-party payers, Le much less likely accepting of a charge uh, like that for a psychiatric illness. And so I would be really disturbed if it turned out that MDMA was approved for PTSD, but imagine that the, the charge was $10,000. And that, you know, Blue Cross and Blue Shield won't pay it. And I'm not picking on them in particular. Well, then it would only be available for those who could afford it. And, I, you know, that's a problem. I, I think it sounds like from talking to other researchers, though, the, the one thing that's particularly promising about psilocybin maybe versus other SRIs or other kind of frontline interventions for mood disorders, et cetera, is that it does seem in the studies like the uh, Michael Bogenschut study with alcohol use disorder is that one dose seems to be so powerful. So yes, I mean, if it's marked up to this, you know, astronomical price, that won't be affordable for anybody. But it seems like the uniqueness of a psilocybin intervention, if it continues to, if the, the, the research um, and the science continue to go in this direction, it seems like there could be a benefit of having it be kind of a one-time use um, intervention. Obviously, Bogenschutz's study was a wonderful study. It showed a very dramatic effect in a very serious group of, of individuals who had, you know, severe alcohol use disorder. There's no question about, about, about the findings. And um, I'm very excited about those studies. And I think from what I've heard from my own patients, um, who've had the experience with psychedelics, not just psilocybin, I, th I think that it's extremely promising. There's no question about it. What, we're, what we do not, you know, if, if you have a chance, there, the FDA put out a briefing document on psychedelics to guide companies who are developing psychedelics for clinical use. And one of the points they made in this guidance is that they're very much focused on the durability and persistence of the effect. So the question is, if you're treating somebody with depression or alcohol use disorder and you treat them with psilocybin and they have a great response, how long will that response last? And then what is the safety and durability about subsequent treatments? One of the things we've learned about ketamine is that it can be effective in some patients transiently, but it's relatively transient. 
and not terribly persistent. And then patients need to get dosed with ketamine over and over and over again. And that's a problem. So, yeah, I think it it sounds like these questions have more questions to them and something that hopefully continued research will expose or help to understand, again, the durability of some of these interventions. Um, you're, You're the first researcher we've talked to who has talked about eating disorders and psilocybin. And I I think it's really interesting because you're kind of talking about this similar feedback loop and like, you know, it kind of intrusive-ish thoughts around shape and weight. That sounds like a population you're hopeful that could benefit from um, psilocybin or or psychedelic intervention. Yeah, this really fascinates me because, number one, anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality of any psychiatric disorder. Number two, there are no FDA-approved treatments for anorexia nervosa. If you think about anorexia, and I've treated these patients, I'm not an expert in this area, but I've treated some of these patients. It's so akin to addiction, I can't even tell you. So the the typical patient would say to me, I, I've decided to abuse laxatives to help myself, you know, keep my weight down. And so I go to the pharmacy and they have the same kind of excitement about Uh, going to the pharmacy and furtively buying laxatives. And then they bring them home, and and when they describe taking them out of the tinfoil wrapping, it's the same description that cocaine users describe about the excitement they have. And then they engage in this behavior, and then they feel remorse and regret the way um, many substance abusers do. And so it's a behavior that they... It's ego dystonic. They don't like it. They wish they didn't have it. They often know that it's damaging to their health. You know, the majority of these patients are women. They haven't had a menstrual period in years. They're damaging their heart. They're damaging their bones. They know it's bad for them, but they can't stop it. And the idea of them you know, eating a McDonald's, you know, Big Mac is as aversive as anything you and I could conjure up that would be aversive to us. So they are in this circle of hell. So we have, um, we're doing an anorexia nervosa study. We're just starting to enroll a psilocybin study uh, in order to see whether this could be helpful. Yeah, it seems like your uh, primary objective is, you know, escaping this circle of hell regardless of the content, and that would be really powerful if that um, is the case. So the, the other study we're doing that I think you'll find of interest is we're taking people with extremely treatment refractory depression, we're going to dose them with psilocybin and then follow it with transcranial magnetic stimulation. So the idea that, that psilocybin will, will soften up the beachhead, so to speak, so that the brain would be more responsive to TMS, which is an FDA-approved treatment for depression. Yeah, that's very interesting, I think, from like a mechanism perspective, right? Trying to intercede or build on the impact of the psilocybin with TMS. And and where do you see that kind of from a mechanistic perspective? Like, um, again, maybe shifting things around initially, and then is it like assimilation or a, like what What do you kind of, what's your theory there? So first sort of knocking them out of the circuit. And then um, because we know from brain imaging studies that what, what psychedelics do to be sort of very succinct is that brain areas that normally communicate a great deal um, communicate less under psychedelics and brain areas that hardly ever talk to each other um, increase their communication. So we think by doing that, getting people out of the rut that they're in neurobiologically, that they would be more responsive to TMS. You're pulling together a lot of theories, you know, maybe about like the the way that TMS works, the way that psychedelic medicine works. Um, and if you were going to bring in this third prong of um genetics and what you were talking about originally to kind of create a powerhouse of precision psychiatry. Um, how are you hoping the the genetics information will integrate with these um, interventions? 
eventually, let's start with the fact that, um, you know, the genome that you and I have and everybody has is immutable, meaning um, it is what it is. It's not going to change so that the whole genome sequencing will eventually be part of your electronic medical record. And it only has to be done once. And this, when this was started with the Human Genome Project, it was very expensive. Now it's not expensive. So all of us will eventually have a whole genome sequencing as part of our EMR. And we will be able to, from that, we'll be able to glean a number of things. First, we'll be able to glean some highly heritable diseases, you know, like sickle cell disease and Huntington's disease very easily, cystic fibrosis, et cetera. But it will also allow us to determine the high likelihood of risk for one or another disorder. And all of us are at risk for something. Some of us risk for diabetes. Some of us are at risk for bipolar disorder. And that this largely involves the polygenic risk scores that I've shown you. So what hasn't been done yet in a large population, other than in the UK Biobank, which I've been very critical of, and I'll tell you why in a minute, is to take, let's pick a number, 500,000 people that all have um, a, a whole genome sequencing and then develop polygenic risk scores and then determine how they do over time and what they respond to um, if they have one or another illness. This has been attempted with the UK Biobank, which is a great um, beginning, but the, the, the issue with that has to do what's called deep phenotyping, which is how carefully do you characterize the psychiatric diagnosis? And the problem with the UK Biobank is that if the word depression appears in the EMR, they're counted as depressed. So they don't get a structured clinical interview um, in which you could know for sure not only whether the patient has major depression, but whether um, what kind of major depression do they have. So if we could develop a, a Framingham-like study where you could actually uh, obtain genetic material and then follow patients over a 10 to 20-year period, and be able to see, you know, their their development in terms of mood and anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, um, that you'd also collect data on environmental events like childhood maltreatment, et cetera. Then you could construct an amazing catalog that would lead to personalized medicine. A catalog for each person you're kind of talking about. You know, fundamentally, um, there are two parts of personalized medicine. One is, what are you at risk for? And the second is, what do you respond to? And most people in the field are focusing on what do you respond to question. And it's important, you know, if you have bipolar disorder, are you a lithium responder or aren't you a lithium responder? That's a really important question, and we still can't answer it, right? But an equally important question is, what are you at risk for? Yeah, and it sounds like um, this is where precision medicine uh, could really grow and, and, again, bring all of this information together, like you said, for this individualized catalog. It sounds like from your original research or what we were talking about earlier, you also see a history of childhood trauma as a factor um, that it seems to impact a large majority of, of people psychiatrically in their future. How do you integrate that understanding? Um, is that something that you would like people to be screened for as early as possible and treated for, or again, kind of um, like given evidence-based treatment or just put into their catalog as a, as a major risk factor? Thank you for asking that question. So childhood maltreatment in the form of child abuse and neglect is a more powerful predictor of health, not just mental health, of health than any other single risk factor. More than tobacco, um, uh, exposure, for example. And individuals with a history of childhood maltreatment have higher rates of obesity, diabetes, asthma, heart disease, stroke, uh, and certain forms of cancer, as well as all of these 
psychiatric disorders we've talked about. So there is a screening tool that we use called the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire. It's available on the internet. It's a very simple um, uh, self. Patients fill this out themselves, and I have every patient fill it out. And it provides you, oftentimes patients find talking about early life trauma difficult, and it's easier for them to put it down on paper. And if I like this better than the more standard ACEs questionnaire, uh, which has been much more widely used, but I think is a little more problematic. But if you, you should use something to screen for child abuse and neglect. And what you'll find in the mental health field is if you're treating people with depression, particularly chronic depression, and they haven't responded to cognitive behavior therapy, they haven't responded to an SSRI, you'll find a preponderance of patients in that group with a history of childhood maltreatment. And how those patients should be treated best is unknown. And one of the things I'm interested in, well, maybe psychedelics would be helpful in this population. In in saying like you're hoping that for the treatment resistant, because there are some like evidence-based treatments, like you said, with CBT or an SRI that could be helpful for people. But if they're in the, the group of people that does not benefit from those interventions, what else do we have for them? And I think that's really the question inspiring a lot of this precision psychiatry. Absolutely. I do want to make sure that I say something about the um, accelerated theta burst transcranial magnetic stimulation, because you were asking me about treatments, and we've spent a lot of time talking about psychedelics. But I think that this is one of the most exciting advances in all of psychiatry, uh, and this comes out of the Stanford group. Um, and so what they did, which was just incredibly um, uh, prescient, was, um, as you probably know, standard FDA-approved TMS is one treatment a day, five days a week for six weeks. And so it's very disruptive for families um, and patients because having to come in every day for a 45-minute treatment for six weeks um, is, you know, difficult for many people. And what the Stanford group did was they did two things that were very special. The first thing they did was to say, we're going to use magnetic resonance imaging to target in each individual patient the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex so you know exactly what the target is in a given patient um, to apply the TMS. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to give them a treatment for 10 minutes every hour for 10 hours in a row for five days in a row. So the patients would come in and they would get treated every hour for 10 minutes with this accelerated third burst TMS. And after five days, uh, the response was hard to believe that these were people that had failed every treatment known to mankind, including ECT, ketamine, and everything else. And they had like a 70% remission rate. So this is a, a absolute game changer for psychiatry. And Hopefully, it'll eventually be paid for uh, by third-party payers. But the fact of the matter is, it can shorten inpatient hospitalizations. People that were this sick and suicidal, um, and you know, the data which has now been published is, we haven't seen data like this in a very long time, mm. or really never. And will there be subsequent studies? to, you know, to show how robust this data is and then hopefully have it integrated um, into, you know, academic medical centers and beyond? Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the questions that the Stanford group is examining is, well, how long does it last? Do the patients need retreatment? And if so, when? How effective is the retreatment? Um, we did a, a bipolar depression study um, haven't broken the blind yet so uh, to see how well they did. But the impression of our faculty was that they did well. And bipolar depression is pretty hard to treat. So I, I think it's, it's a major advance for the field. And there, there is, on the back of that, 
there is a new experimental treatment, neuromodulation treatment called focused ultrasound. And what's interesting about focused ultrasound is unlike TMS, which is pretty limited to the cortex, the outer part of the brain, focused ultrasound can go to deeper parts of the brain. And we've just finished a pilot study uh, focusing on the amygdala. And uh, as many of the um, uh, listeners will know, the amygdala is an area of hyperactivity in patients with stress-related disorders particularly depression and PTSD. And we were able to reduce the activity of the amygdala uh, with focused ultrasound in this small study. And the patients that were a mixed group of depression and anxiety showed a, a very robust clinical response. So really exciting. Yeah. We've highlighted a lot of great research, some that we can hope to see or is already in practice, some that we can hope to see um, in more widespread practice and accessibility in the future. Um, and it also sounds like you're a clinician who has been motivated by your treatment of patients. Um, and I'm just, you know, for our kind of final few minutes, any words of advice, wisdom, uh, direction for those psychiatrists who are in practice um, and maybe less directly connected to the research? Um, I think that that trauma screen you were discussing can be uh, a great tool to use, but any any advice for for those psychiatrists in practice? Like, what can they do with this information at this point? You know, the great thing about treating depression is there are a lot of of opportunities out there, and because we can't really predict what a patient will respond to, um, each of you have to develop an algorithm for your own practice. So, I think in general, I start people with an SSRI. If they don't respond, I switch to an SNRI. There are some patients that need inordinately high doses. Um, it's not unusual for me to prescribe 450 milligrams of venlafaxine, for example, uh, for patients with treatment-resistant depression. The combination of antidepressants like venlafaxine and mirtazapine, for example. The use of MAO inhibitors, um, you know, the new generation of psychiatrists meaning the last 30 years, do not know how to prescribe MAOIs, and they're afraid of them because of the so-called cheese reaction. They're great drugs that work really well in people with treatment-resistant depression. I've got psychiatry residents who've never prescribed a tricyclic antidepressant because they're only prescribing SSRIs. All of these are options for patients um, with depression. And I think as psychiatrists, we should be compelled to offer patients what's available in the current pharmacopoeia. And and it sounds like being uh, maybe less apprehensive um, and, and really following the data, following the science and not over-interpreting maybe certain negative findings? Yeah, I, I think, you know, follow the science is the right answer. I, I think, you know, one has to be um, uh, sanguine about uh, all the hype about certain treatments. And one has to be sanguine about the concern about adverse events. I think, you know, the best example I could give you, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist by training, and there's a warning about an increased risk of stroke if you use atypical antipsychotics in the elderly with dementia. There is a, a statistically significant increase, but the absolute rate is very low. And if you have an elderly patient with dementia, and prescribing an atypical will allow them to stay at home compared to go to a nursing home, it's worth the risk because it's a pretty low risk of them having a stroke. So I think, you know, people often uh, do defensive prescribing because they're worrying about medical legal consequences. But if you ask yourself, what's best for the patient, right, you'll be guided in the right direction. Well, those are wonderful I think, words to be inspired by in practice. And um, thank you so much for bringing all this promising research to the forefront, and we'll be excited to continue to watch where it all goes. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks so much for that conversation, Dr. Nemiroff. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry on your podcast app. For the Department of Psychiatry at NYU Langone, I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. See you next time.